This is a Civil War crowd here. I know everybody here knows Appomattox, and you probably know quite a bit about it, uh, especially April 9th. For me, April 9th isn't the story. April 9th is kind of an anticlimactic finish. The story is April 3rd to April 9th, seven days to Appomattox. Lee's trying to get away from Grant. He's not going to make it. I, I'm going to use the word delusional quite often, the way he just drags on trying to get away from Grant. But we're going to start this today. At, oh, and uh, this is where we're at. There's Petersburg down here. Richmond's 20 miles up. And they're heading over for Appomattox Courthouse, which is 93 miles away from Richmond and Petersburg. I, I googled it. So that's where we're going to be. That's the area we'll be talking about. The story does start, though, the first day of April. You've certainly heard of Five Forks. It's Lee's extreme right. He's trying to hold his line. He knows Grant wants to get around him and roll up his, his line. So he gets some soldiers out there to Five Forks, about 5,000 soldiers and some cavalry. And he's going to try to hold that uh, and repulse Grant's uh, attempt to roll up his flank. He's not going to have a chance. Uh, and th isn't that a nice aerial view of Five Forks? You got Five Forks there, and you can see how it falls together here. Again, April 1st, 1865, it's on a Saturday. The Confederates are lined up. Sheridan's in charge of this operation. He's got cavalry down here. He calls in the Second Corps from out east a little bit, and they go at it, and they're just going to pound away at uh, the front line here, and the uh, Fifth Corps is going to just roll up the flank here, and these men are going to be captured if not killed. These men, most of them can get away, but uh, Lee's going to lose 5,000 men today. Now, just a week ago, he had about 40,000 men. He lost 5,000 at Fort Stedman. That was another battle five days before, so now he's at 35,000. Today, he loses uh, another 5,000, so now he's down to about, well, he's going to be at 30,000 when he leaves uh, Petersburg. So he's losing men. That was a tough day for Lee. And as a result of this defeat, some rider goes back to Grant, and Grant's down here. He was up at City Point for quite a while. I'll talk about City Point as opposed to as from Petersburg. Abraham Lincoln's camping there for a couple of weeks here uh, with uh, Grant to see how this is all going to end. But uh, Grant's moved his headquarters, because that's where his headquarters was. Grant came, at, came down here because he knew that, that okay, because he knew this was going to uh, end pretty soon. But as a result of this defeat at Five Forks, Grant is going to call for an all-out attack on Petersburg. He wants, in his own words, he wants to end it. And everybody's been in their trenches for a year. Ever since last July or last June, they've been in their trenches. This is April. This is, what, 10 months? They're ready to get going again. He wants to end it. And so at 4 a.m. on Sunday morning, April 2nd, he calls out for the greatest cannonade of the war. The Union artillery just lets loose. And the Confederates, they return fire, and the night is just filled with fire. Somebody in their um, letter home said, it was the rolling thunder of heavy metal. That's an apt description. And five, way, five miles away at Five Forks, which we just talked about, they compared the Fifth Corps, they compared it with watching the Aurora Borealis, you know, the Northern Lights. And Lincoln, he's also viewing the action from City Points, also five miles away. It just lit up the sky. And that went on for about two hours. And then it ended. And I'm telling you, when the guns go silent, the silence is deafening. Because the Union infantry is ready to attack. And here they come. Just before dawn, A.P. Hill, he's the one holding this line over here for Lee. His men can hear this noise, and it's getting closer and closer and closer, and it, they know what it is. It's 15,000 footsteps coming at them, trampling over soft, damp ground. Here they come. And the Union forces they attack in a wedge, and this is a division coming at them. 
So a core coming at them. So the first division is in a wedge. Second division is in a wedge here. Third wedge. And they go right into the middle. Well, of course, they're going to get through like that. And you wonder who the first person was. Does anybody know? How could anybody really be remembered as the first person to the line? Well, they do. It was Captain Gold of the 5th Vermont. First Union soldier over the trenches and into the uh, Confederate lines. And look at the sabers coming at him there. He's going to take three saber wounds. And thank goodness his sergeant was a few steps behind him. He was able to save him, probably killed the guy with the saber. And after that, all of the other infantry followed, just spilling into the Confederate lines there. Captain Gold got out of there. He did survive, and he got the Medal of Honor. The Confederate line breaks in only 20 minutes. They, they were, it was a thin line, thin all the way around Petersburg. And so this message goes out at 1040 AM. Lee is seeing his uh, lines get rolled up. When that wedge came through, there was no putting it back together. And so he sends off this telegram to Richmond. And uh, Jeff Davis is in church. It's at uh, 10 o'clock or so, 1040 AM. And the message is, I would advise that all preparations be made for leaving Richmond tonight. I will advise you later according to circumstances. Of course, everybody in this church is looking at Davis when he gets this message and the preacher goes silent and the place is completely silent. They're all looking at Davis. And they said his face didn't change expressions, but the color of his face changed expressions. And he stood up and he walked out of the church. So everybody in that church knew something was up and word got around town real quick. So there's a breakthrough in Lee's only escape because he's south of the Appomattox River. Petersburg is on the south side of the river. His only chance to escape is get to the north side of the river. He only got so many bridges, he had to get more bridges put up. And he has to get, what, 30,000 men or so um, out of there? To do that, his lines that are on the front lines there, they've got to hold back Grant's men. So there's going to be fighting going on all day long as Lee gets his wagons out of there, he gets his supplies out of there, he gets his uh, front uh, lines out of there and gets them moving uh, to, to, uh, to the west. He tells his generals to meet at Amelia Courthouse. He is going to get out of there. He's going to lose 5,000 men today. Now he's down to 30,000. Okay, he's going to lose 5,000 today. Here's Amelia Courthouse over here. That's 40 miles away from Petersburg, and it's an equal distance to Richmond. This is the obvious place to go, because this is what's called the Danville Railroad and Road. He wants to grab this and go down here 100 miles to Danville, but the, right at the south end of Virginia. That's his plan. And here's the cast of characters. You got Yule, you might remember him on July 2nd in Gettysburg. He's got the Richmond garrison. Mahone, he's got the Bermuda Division. That's the area between Richmond and Petersburg, right around here. Longstreet, everybody knows Longstreet. He was up there. He brought his men down here to help hold the line, but it broke anyway. Gordon's Second Corps, Anderson's Fourth Corps. Here's their, and F. Lee, Fitzhugh Lee, Lee's nephew. So they head out uh, tomorrow, and they're going to be heading west for Amelia Courthouse. What's going on in Richmond? Davis and his government, they're going to escape. They're going to catch just, I think it was the last train right before midnight. And they're heading for Danville, 100 miles away. They don't go 60 miles an hour like you do any other time. The road is in such bad shape, they could only go 10 miles an hour, just lumbering along. It takes them 10 hours to get to Danville. Davis, he's got no intention of giving up. He, he has no intention of giving up. He is going to continue this and continue it and continue it. This is his White House down in Danville. He's only going to have it for seven days or so. Uh, and his government is going to fill every available room in the town. And again, here's Richmond. And you follow the Danville Road down to Danville. It's 100 miles. Petersburg is 20 miles from Richmond, and Appomattox Courthouse is 93 miles from the two, okay? 
what happens to Richmond afterwards? Well, when all the Confederates get out of there, their rear guard has been giving orders to burn uh, the bridges, the arsenals, the storehouses. They're put to the torch. And the mayor comes running out, and city council comes running out, and all these businessmen come running out, and they're imploring these soldiers, don't put this to the torch. We got a wind blowing tonight. Well, they're following orders, and they do it anyway. Well, you remember the Chicago fire of 1871. That's probably the only thing that uh, does this fire uh, in Richmond that night. And it gets worse. They got scavengers, they got deserters, they have prison outbreak. The convicts escaped because the guards all ran away. They're just pillaging and roaming and doing whatever they want. There's screams everywhere. It's complete anarchy. I can't imagine a worse place to be for crime and flames. Up to 100 people died. They don't have an exact number that goes anywhere from 60 to 100. So, And of course, everybody's frightened, including Mrs. Lee and Mrs. George Pickett. They're there by themselves. Uh, they might have had family or servants, but they're there with no protection to speak of. Lee's already marching. He left in the middle of the night on day one, as I call it, April 3rd. It's a 40-mile march to Amelia Courthouse. These men haven't marched in a year. This is going to be kind of tough on the muscles. Uh, but they're happy to get out of the trenches. There's even, at the very start, some kind of exhilaration. We're finally moving. We're finally out of here. Well, that's going to change real quick when they get so tired and hungry and exhausted. Back in Petersburg, as Lee has left and the cannonading is stopping, well, that was the day before, uh, Lee has left, so the flag goes up at 4.38 a.m. right here at the courthouse. That courthouse is still there today. Grant watches the last of Lee's soldiers escape across the river, and they're sitting ducks. They're just trying to get out of there. And his men are on this side, and they could just take pot, shot, pot shots all night long, all day long at them. Grant orders him to stop, because he knows he's going to capture them all in a couple days anyway. He doesn't want any loss of life needlessly. And Lincoln comes in from City Point to talk to Grant and just to get an update as to what, what's going to happen now. They meet in this house here in Petersburg. It's called the Wallace House. It's probably very famous today there in Petersburg. They talk for an hour and a half, and then Grant heads west. Lincoln report, returns to City Point, and he's going to stay there for a few more days. It's still day one, April 3rd, mid-morning, the Army of the Potomac begins its chase. You got uh, Sheridan, it's in charge of the cavalry. You got General Ord in charge of the James. I, the Butler used to have that one, and he got fired, and Ord was given that uh, assignment. Park took over Burnside's uh, uh, corps. Griffin, he, he got that job yesterday, or two days ago, at Five Forks, because Warren uh, performed badly in the eyes of Sheridan. Sheridan fired him on the spot and put Griffin in charge. So he's, he's learning as he goes. Humphreys, he's been doing his job since uh, November. He took over for uh, Hancock, who was injured at Gettysburg, but he stuck to the job, but his leg hurts too much, and he, uh, he's going to retire. And so Humphreys gets his job. And Wright took over. He's, he's been on the job the longest. He took over for Sedgwick. Remember Sedgwick, who got shot in the forehead at Spotsylvania when he said that uh, they couldn't hit an elephant from this distance. Next thing you know, he takes it right in the forehead. So, day two. It's Tuesday. Lincoln's going to take a field trip today. And Lee is going to suffer a major disappointment. Lincoln's going to go to Richmond. He wants to see Richmond. He's been wanting his generals to take Richmond for four years. Well, he changed it and said, just go for the armies. But at first they wanted Richmond. Well, they finally have Richmond. He takes his son Tad with him. They go from City Point up to James River, escorted by a dozen armed Marines. Of course, they were armed. They walk the streets to Wetzel's headquarters. He's a division commander there. And the uh, headquarters is the former White House that Davis was in. 
and they're just surrounded by hundreds of African Americans that are so jubilant. They're down on their knees giving thanks, and Lincoln would say, don't get on your knees for me. You, you pray for the good Lord there. He's the one that freed you. That's a true story. And at the White House, Lincoln is given lunch, a tour of the house, and afterwards, oh, this is his favorite part, is when he gets to sit in Davis's chair, who was just there a day or two before. And then he takes a carriage ride. Here he is, going through the streets of Richmond. So he's having a wonderful day. He stops off to vis visit Mrs. George Pickett uh, and her new baby. He was told that she was over in that house over there, Mr. President. So he wanted to go see her. They knew each other, he and Pickett. Uh, Pickett, or uh, Lincoln's uh, former law partner in Illinois, uh, saw to it that he got an appointment to West Point. And Lincoln was somewhat involved with that too. So he knows uh, Pickett, knew him before the war. All right, it's been 40 miles, day two, 36 hour march. They pull into Amelia Courthouse. And Lee has 60,000 rations ordered for his men, for his 30,000 men. And that ought to sustain them for another day or two until they get to their next point where there'll be more rations waiting for them. These men are hungry. They're tired. They haven't slept. They haven't eaten. They're famished. They're exhausted. They hit the ground waiting for their rations to be served. There are no rations. The train rumbles into Amelia Courthouse. They open up the boxcars and it's filled with ammunition. Somebody in Richmond made a mistake. There are no rations. And, and they said that this was when Lee really didn't lose his composure. He just, they said his face really drained. It turned gray. You could see the look in his eyes. It's like, we're defeated. We can't, my men need to eat. He recovers himself. He sends wagons out to the countryside. Try to get us some food. Find whatever you can. Bring it back. And he's going to have to wait for the wagons to come back. He's going to have to wait all night and into the next day. They're not going to find any food. If not, it's that much. And it's obvious that the only way these men are going to subsist on anything, the only thing there is, is parched corn for the animals. And you can see him being given a handful of parched corn. Here's some for you. Eat it slowly, one at a time. We'll get you some food in a couple days. Uh, this is going to be too much for a lot of the men. They're not going to be able to continue. Now, Jetersville is right below Amelia Courthouse. It's right here. Sheridan is going to get there before evening, and that's 10 miles south of where Lee is. And he knows that Lee's up there. He's the cavalry. They know everything. So he entrenches right above town, about 10 miles, not 10 miles, just about a mile above town. And the Fifth Corps uh, arrives oh, a couple hours later. After dark, Sheridan, he couldn't move against Lee with just his cavalry. He needs infantry, okay? He can chase them and, and, and make trouble for them, but he can't defeat the infantry. There's too many compared to the number of cavalry. So when Meade gets there with his, <coughs> excuse me, second and sixth division, Sheridan is all excited to, let's go now, let's go now. They're right there. They're 10 miles away. We can take them right now. He's still all wound up from Five Forks. And he's always been wound up. He always wants battle. He's the one that really got this uh, Grant's army to where they were at this time because of his fortitude. Meade is suffering from an illness right now, a flu, bad cold, something. He's tired. He's been in an ambulance all day long, getting jerked along the roads there. Now he's in, Jeter, uh, in Jetersville. No, we can wait till tomorrow. He wants to sleep. That's my read on it. But he does say, no, we'll go tomorrow. And I do know that he was sick. And the books say that he, didn't, he was not feeling well. So he tells them we're going to wait till the morning. Which takes us into day three, April 5th. Lee's going to be forced to adjust his plans. Remember his plans was to just keep heading south on the Danville Road to Danville. And then from there, he's going to go down into Carolina and join up with Johnston, who I, I never said that before, but that is the entire plan join the two armies together. Well, he's not going to be able to do that now. He's got to adjust his plans. At noon, he's going to begin his 100-mile march for Danville. Really, it's more like uh, 60 miles. 100 miles is from Richmond. But he knows that there's Union cavalry in Jetersville. Now, he does have that report. He knows Sheridan is there. 
Uh, but he thinks he can push through the cavalry, and usually with infantry, if you have that many more than the cavalry, it's a matter of just pushing through. But then, as he comes down the road, he finds out, uh-oh, there's infantry there. I can't push through them. Even if I wanted to, my men aren't up for that. So he has to turn around and head this way. He's going to keep heading west over to a place called Rice Station. It's on the railroad. He's going to call Lynchburg, which is another 50 miles west, and they are going to send him rations. That's his plan now. And once he gets that, he thinks he might take, you can't see a road here, but there's a road going. He thinks maybe he can take the road down here to Danville. That's when I'll start saying delusion. There's no way. Of course, the Federals are going to stay up with him and even get ahead of him. But anyway, plan A is to uh, go down the Danville, go down to the Danville Road, or plan B is to continue west. Well, he's going to be doing plan B. Again, his men are sick. They're hungry. They're starving. They're exhausted. They are just dropping like flies. He started with 30,000 men. He's lost thousands already. His so officers, all they can do is look on helplessly. You can't order those men back in line. They collapse. They're spent. They're done. They're going off begging food in the countryside. People are trying to help them, but they don't have much to give them. All the houses in the area are going to be turned into hospitals for all these sick, hungry men. And that takes us up to day four, Tuesday, April 6th. Oh, Lee's having such a hard time now. Could it get any tougher? Yeah, today it gets really tough. Today, the historians call this on this seven-day march, Black Thursday, a devastating day for Lee. Okay, Meade is going to, as he said, he's going to start beginning his march at dawn, and he heads up to Amelia um, Courthouse to find that Lee has already left. He already began his march, going over to Rice Station. Uh, when he gets to Amelia, he finds, uh, he turns out that Meade's rear guard is already four miles in front of him. If the rear guard is four miles in front of him, imagine where the front is. It's way up there, almost to Rice Station by now. That's how far behind Meade is, and that's why Sheridan wanted to get going immediately. We lost him, he got away. So Meade's forced to turn around a little bit and head west on another road. And Sheridan, of course, his cavalry, they're off and running west to catch Lee's army. And soon he's going to be closing in on Lee's column. And again, Lee's exhausted, starving men, so many of them can't even budge today. So Lee's going to lose thousands more men just from marching. I know you don't remember these two uh, names. They are not with uh, Meade's uh, Army of uh, the Potomac. They have their own commands. Grant has them on the south end, or down here, chasing um, Lee. Their job is to get in front of Lee. And Meade and Sheridan's job is to keep hitting Lee on his flanks, trying to slow him down so these two can get in front of him. Well. They are now in Burksville. There's Jetersville. Lee's up here marching that way. Um, Meade is going over this way. Sheridan is all over the place here trying to catch uh, his columns, Lee's columns. They get here finally. And when they get there, Ord says, uh, Ord immediately sends a detachment up to Rice Station just to get in front of Lee, hopefully, and delay him by any means possible until he can get the rest of his men there or until Meade can get there. All right, but he he's wants to get in front of him, get some men in front of Lee. Lee and Longstreet, they're going to arrive at the Rice Station before the rest of the army because they are in the lead. And when Lee learns that some Federals came up from Burksville, he gets word to his generals that, well, we're not going to go south after this. We're going to keep heading west to a place called Farmville. It's six miles west of Rice Station. So these men are going to have to keep marching. There's not going to be any rations there. The rations are going to be at Farmville. And when Longstreet learns that these Federals have already passed through Rice Station, 80 cavalry and 800 infantry, he orders his cavalry to go up there, intercept them, and 
uh, hold the bridge that's up there at all cost. There's a bridge up there that we're going to talk about right now called Hyde Bridge. If they lose that bridge, that could affect uh, the escape plan for the rest of the Confederate for, uh, Army. There's two bridges that they, they can go by, straight up on High Bridge or keep heading west to Farmville. They're probably going to want both bridges. He wants that bridge safe. Here's High Bridge. You might recognize this from uh, some TV channel. I think it's AMC. They, for whatever reason, they show that a lot. And here's another view of it. 21 spans, half a mile long, 126 feet high. It was, I think, the largest bridge when it was built. The 1,200 Confederate cavalry arrive just in time to stop the, the Federals, and they fight, and they fight, and the Union losses are total. Doesn't mean they all got killed. It means they got captured for the most part. They lost half of their cavalry. I don't think they lost any infantry. They were all captured. And when the infantry is being captured, uh, they're laughing at the Confederates who are capturing them because they're saying, go ahead and capture us. We're going to be free in three or four days when Grant catches up to you. And he was right. There's another view of it. Has anyone been there to see this? I, I want to see. Have you? Did you walk across that bridge? This one here? Good for you. And there's the original spans there. All right. Meanwhile, several miles east at a place called Holtz Corners. Now remember, Lee took his army this way. Okay, now he already got up to Rice Station. He's got plenty of columns still behind him. These two here who are in the front there, along here, they get ahead of the army, and at that time, right around here, they're getting hit by Sheridan. Now Sheridan isn't going after the infantry right away. He's going after their wagons who are behind him. And when that happens, they tell the wagon folks take the north route here, we'll continue this way. And they have this general here backing them up, Gordon. He's coming behind them, and he doesn't know. He, he sees all the wagons going up here, so he figures these two generals went that way too. He figures the whole column went this way, so he follows them. No, he was supposed to follow them to protect them. He's the rear guard. Well, he didn't know that. Bad communication. So he goes north, these two go south, and they've got, uh, they've got Sheridan to deal with, and they're going to have an infantry corps coming at them. They're going to be completely outnumbered. Maybe all of you have heard of Battle of Sailor's Creek. I know probably half of you have. This was devastating to this march. Ewell and Anderson are going to be overrun by Sheridan and the 6th Infantry. Now, Sheridan's down here coming at Anderson, uh, and... Uh, the 6th Infantry is coming from behind along the road there. They're going to overrun Ewell. Ewell's losses are going to be complete. They're all going to be captured, including uh, Custis Lee, uh, Lee's son. These folks are going to have a heck of a battle for quite a while. This part of the line is going to get away. This part of the line is going to be captured. Look at that. All of these men are going to be captured from the Confederates. Only this little brigade down here is going to get away. So de just devastating. Now, what happened to Gordon, who uh, went north? Well, he's caught by the Second Corps. And that battle is going to go on for most of the day. And he's not going to get any support from anyone. And it's getting so bad that he, he's saying, I'm going to lose all my men, all 5,000, if I stay here. So he breaks off. He's forced to, leaving behind his rear guard of 2,000 men and 200 wagons. But he gets most of, I mean, more of his men away, three to 4,000 men. But total, they lost 8,000 8, men were captured today. Nearly 25% of Lee's army. That's so devastating. Not to mention all the thousands and thousands are dropping out. This is when Lee's going to become del delusional to keep it going. Uh, this will be the largest amount of prisoners taken in battle in one day during the war. Now you can say, well, Vicksburg, okay, well, that was more of a siege and it wasn't really a battle. They gave up after, what, 60 days. This was a battle in one day and, and 8,000 men were captured. That had never happened in any other Civil War battle. That many men. Lee, he's up at Rice Station looking at his wristwatch, wondering what's taken his men so long. So he goes back with a detail 
to see if they can see what's going on. Well, he gets up on a high ridge and he can see Anderson's men coming along and they look like they've had enough. Uh, they're not carrying their guns for them. Or, well, some of them are, but a lot of them don't even have guns. They're just straggling, trying to get up to Lee in Longstreet. He's looking from this bluff and he looks down at this army and he goes, my God, has the army been dissolved? Well, it hadn't been, but uh, it might as well have been. Lee lost half his army in three days. And again, his son Custis is among the prisoners. Half his army in three days. And he <coughs> continues on. Okay, that evening, Sheridan's had a, just a great day, and he informs Grant. And Grant then, uh, oh, he tells Grant, Sheridan tells Grant, if the thing is pressed, I believe we can end this now. Grant telegrams the news to Lincoln in City Point, and Lincoln replies, well, let the thing be pressed. Now, there's a little message behind this, um, or a story behind this, Sheridan is riding along with Meade. They don't get along at all. And Sheridan doesn't think Meade's doing all he can to end this now. Well, Sheridan just showed everybody, if we press, we can get this thing done. And he says, so if we keep it pressed, Meade, keep up with me, uh, we can end this. And Lincoln says, let the thing be pressed. That's really what that was all about. Oh, and the Federals, after Sailor's Creek, had a huge party that night. They've got all these prisoners and they've got all of these goods that they got from the wagons that came from Richmond. And a lot of them are filled with chests, filled with Confederate currency. And they're grabbing this currency, which is worthless now. And they're tossing it around and they're tossing it at the Confederate soldiers and they're playing poker. I'll raise you $10,000. I'll see that and raise you 20,000. <laughs> and they're throwing it into the fire. They're just having a ball that night. Imagine how the soldier, the Confederate soldiers, how humiliating. That was day four, Black Thursday. Now it's Friday, April 7. Finally, this is the one day these soldiers are finally going to get some real food. The rations have come into Farmville, which is only six miles from Rice Station. So it was an overnight march to get to Farmville. They don't all get there at the same time, but they do get there. And here's, here's a man, General Wise, He's a former uh, governor of Virginia, and so um, he's not that intimidated by Lee. And he walks in the Lee's uh, tent the next day, and he's not afraid to speak his mind. He tells Lee to end this war. And he goes on and on, and Lee can't believe he's being talked to like that. But he's allowing General Wise to talk to him like that. And finally, almost one author said it was like a child's voice. Well, uh, what would the country say? <laughs> Wrong thing to say. Wise explodes and says, damn the country, sir. You are the country and you have been for the past year. These men follow you, not Davis. So that was his last word. And here comes the food. Finally, they're given food, their uh, rations, and they're south of the river. Farmville is south of the river. There's a bridge. Men, grab your rations and they had to cook them. Take it north to the north side there. Cook them up there. When everybody's on the north side, we're going to burn this bridge because we know the Federals are going to be coming along. So let's get everybody up, up on the other side. Well, then here comes this rider saying that the Federals are at High Bridge. Now, the Confederate, I mean, the Federal, yeah, the Federals are at High Bridge, six miles behind Lee's army. Lee wanted this bridge and that bridge taken out. Well, this bridge was not the whole span, just like one span, that's all you needed to do. But they didn't have time to, turn, to knock that one out because here came the uh, Federal Cavalry. So they got out of there and they had to come and tell Lee we couldn't torch that bridge. So now Lee and his generals have to tell the soldiers, eat up, eat up, we, we gotta move, we gotta move. They were gonna, they were gonna eat and sleep for several hours. You know how they were looking forward to this? Well, they got to eat a little bit, but they had to get up and start marching again. And as the Union Cavalry came on the south side, and, but the, the uh, Lee's uh, infantry had got to the north side, so the bridges were burned, but Lee's cavalry uh, was still on the south side to deal with the Federal Cavalry. 
And Lee told his son, Rooney Lee, don't let your men think of surrender. Keep their spirits up. I promise to get you out of this. Oh, man, delusional. So, hate to eat and run, uh, these men had to gobble up as soon as they could, as, as fast as they could, the food that's given to them, and they move out. Lee's next stop is going to be Appomattox Station, which is 25 miles west. That's where their next round of rations will be waiting from them. Again, the rations are coming on the railroad. I forget which one it is, but it comes out of Lynchburg, Virginia, which is further to the west. And that's where Lee's heading, is Lynchburg. So from there, he can go south. Now, Gordon took all that abuse yesterday. He's been in the rear. Lee says, okay, Longstreet, Gordon, you switch. Longstreet, you got the rear guard. Gordon, you got the front guard. Gordon must have been pretty happy about that. Here is a story that deals with uh, General Ewell, who was captured, remember, at Sailor's Creek. Turns out the federal surgeon that uh, was there uh, was his cousin. So he let loose to his cousin, and he told them that their cause is lost and that they should have surrendered when they had the opportunity to negotiate favorable terms. Too late for that now. Unconditional surrender. Well, that got back to Grant, and he thought, you know, maybe, maybe Lee's starting to think along the same lines. So he writes a letter to have sent to Lee, and he's, in the letter it states that, Lee, your position is hopeless and any further effusion of blood will be on your hands. And he ends the letter by asking Lee to surrender. Let's end this. Lee receives Grant's letter that night, Friday night, April 7th. It must have been right before midnight or something. He reads it. He's in the front of the campfire, I think, with Longstreet. He reads it, and he hands it to Longstreet, and Longstreet reads it. And Longstreet, only two words. He, comes out of his very, that, that's just so long street. He hands it back and says, not yet. So I guess he's as delusional as Lee. <laughs> Lee writes Grant asking his surrender terms. And then uh, he takes off on its third night march in a row. His army is marching again, the third night in a row. And another thousand men are gonna fall out before dawn. Dawn the next day, they're not gonna march. They said, had enough. Okay, day six, Saturday, April 8th. I call this one false hope. The day dawns sunny and warm as Lee enjoys an unexpected law from attacks. Oh good, we're doing fine. His men have eaten and there's more food up ahead. And with luck, they can still reach Lyn Lynchburg and escape to North Carolina. That's the kind of morning he's having. He's riding Traveler, and it's a beautiful sunny day. Spring, spring in Virginia is just so beautiful. He's feeling good this morning. And he hasn't been attacked. Unexpected law from attacks. What, does he think he's that far out in front? No, no. Lee, I mean Sheridan, he has stopped his attacks intentionally. Now he's going to put his efforts in getting in front of Lee. So this is, again, Saturday, April 8th. And this is the day that Grant and Lee start exchanging letters. Now, Grant thought that Lee was considering surrender when Lee sent a letter asking for what are the terms of the, your surrender that you want. So he writes Lee that his men must lay down their arms and sign parole papers, which will allow them to return to their homes. That simple. And now Lee responds. He says, well, I'm not ready to surrender. I didn't mean that. <laughs> I just want to know what the terms were. And when Grant reads this message, he interprets that as Lee's, Lee intends to carry on the fight. Well, I, I would too, don't you think? So as a result, Grant gets his famous migraine headache. And you've probably heard about the famous migraine he had before Appomattox. <laughs> Excuse me. He spent the night soaking his feet, which was what he did when he got his migraines, and applying mustard packs to the back of his neck. Interesting. Appomattox Station is right up ahead. And who's the first one there? Custer. Custer and his division of uh, cavalry. His scouts have informed him that Lee's rations from Lynchburg have arrived 
at Appomattox Station. Appomattox Station is two miles to the west of Appomattox Courthouse. Okay, so it's two different Appomattoxes in that regard. These boxcars are there, they're being loaded into wagons, Confederate wagons, the food, the rations, everybody, everything there is being loaded into the wagons. Well, they don't get it all loaded in time and out of there. Here comes Custer with his men. And they arrive in time to capture the train, the wagons, and he takes prisoners. And then all he has to do is ride, then he rides east. He wants to see if he's gonna run into the Confederates, and he does in just one mile. Gordon, remember, Gordon is supposed to have the easy job now because he's in front. Well, he's a little bit west of Appomattox Courthouse, and now, and he's only a mile from Appomattox Station, but blocking him is Custer. Custer sends word to Sheridan that they are now in front of Lee. And how do you think Sheridan felt? Pretty exhilarated, don't you think? He presses Ord to hurry, hurry, hurry. Get up here, join me. Ord's down here. He needs to come up there and join him there to this area here. His, Ord's men are exhausted, just like the, it's not the, just the Confederates that are hungry, they're more hungry. But Ord's men are exhausted. They've been marching just as fast as the, as the Confederates, if not faster. Well, they would be faster because they're healthier. They, but they have to go 30 miles in 21 hours and they're gonna do it. And they want to be in on the kill. They want to be there to witness the end. And they've been promised breakfast. So Ord's men join Sheridan. They reach, Ord's men reach Sheridan before dawn, and they take the position on the Lynchburg Road. That's what connects uh, Appomattox Courthouse with Appomattox Station. And soon after, Griffin's Fifth Corps is going to arrive. So Lee is caught. He's got men behind him. He's got infantry in front of him. Here we go now, day seven, April 9th. This is the day everybody knows so well, right? But what about those six days that led up to this? Oh my. Lee knows that there's federal cavalry in his front and what does he usually say? Push through them. He doesn't know that there's infantry up there. So at first light, Gordon's men climb the ridge and in front of them are dismounted cavalry and uh, they're gonna fall back out of view. The cavalry, Federal Cavalry, they've been told, do not engage. Back up slowly, let the Confederate infantry approach you. You get over the ridge. We want them to come up to the ridge. And so the Confederates, and they're exhilarated, I think. They're going up the ridge. They, they got this handled, the cavalry is just backing off. There, and, and the station's only a mile away, breakfast. So they come up to the top of the ridge and they look down and they must have looked at each other and said, what is this, Woodstock? I mean, the place is just filled, just filled with, with Federals, blue coats, muskets, 30,000 of them. There's only 5,000 uh, Confederates. They don't have a chance. So nobody orders an assault. Nobody orders a charge on either side, but they do exchange gunfire. Longstreet, in the meantime, he's in the back on the other side of Appomattox Courthouse. He's been caught by the uh, federal infantry behind him. And Lee knows that Longstreet's been caught, but he's hoping they can just keep pushing forward, keep pushing forward. But then he's told, no, Gordon can't go forward. There's infantry in front of him. Now he knows he's trapped. He's gonna have one more meeting with his generals. And Longstreet starts the conversation and he asks if sacrificing the army will help the Confederacy elsewhere. And Lee answers, I think not. So Longstreet responds, then your situation speaks for itself. And Mahone, another general, I haven't, haven't talked about him much, he concurs, it is your duty to surrender. That's the word. That's the only reason why Lee's been doing this all the time, it's his duty. He can't surrender until he has to. Edward Porter Alexander disagrees. He's in charge of the ar artillery. You remember him from Gettysburg and all those bombings there on July 3rd before Pickett's charge. He disagrees. He recommends that Lee scatter the army to the woods and allow the men to seek active commands elsewhere. I'm telling you, if Jeff Davis had heard him say that, he would 
yes, that's what we're going to do. That's exactly what Grant doesn't want to happen. That's exactly what Lincoln doesn't want to happen. And here's a Confederate officer saying, that's what we should do. Well, Lee doesn't even think very long about that. His response is, if I were to follow your suggestion, our men would be without rations and under no control of officers. They would be compelled to rob and steal in order to survive. The enemy's cavalry would pursue them and overrun wide areas where they would otherwise have no occasion to visit. We would bring on a state of affairs that would take the, years, take the country years to recover from. <laughs> Edward Porter Alexander, young man, he, he said to himself later uh, when he wrote about it, he said, I had not a single word to say in response. He answered my suggestion from a plane so far above it that I was ashamed of having made it. I think we've all had moments like that where we should have kept our mouths shut. <laughs> Lee makes the decision, and this is the famous line that you've all heard, then there is nothing left for me to do but to go see General Grant, and I would rather die a thousand deaths. So Lee sends Grant a message asking to meet to discuss terms for the surrender of his army. For the surrender of his army. Okay, he hasn't said that before. Oh, then he has to turn his attention to Sheridan and Meade. They're still out there. Their men are still facing each other. The firing has stopped, uh, but he has to get word to them that uh, it's over. We're, we're asking Grant to let us surrender. But Sheridan and me, and Sheridan especially, wants to continue it. He loves just to bag the whole lot. He likes taking prisoners. He doesn't want to surrender. He, wouldn't, he would rather have, a, uh, have them all as prisoners. Gordon and Longstreet, they send riders across lines with truth flags. All firing ceases as the soldiers on both sides realize something big is happening. Now, there wasn't that many casualties that day. That's why I just made this picture here. You see, those Confederates died in one Union. And I got to believe that the Union side, the families came to recover their um, lost ones. And I'm sure a lot of the Confederates did too. But these were the ones that were buried there. Not that many graves. Lee rides back to his camp. He's going to get ready for the surrender. He's going to rest, and then he's going to put on his last clean uniform and ride to the village, Appomattox Courthouse. Grant's been riding around the lines to join Sheridan, and uh, he gets word. He stayed here last night with his migraine headache. He's riding along here. Well, Sheridan's got word to him that, no, you come join us. We're in front of him. You want to see this. Well, Grant does want to see it. So he rides cross country with his staff. And then they ride along here, which is the route that Ord took in Sheridan. Well, here comes a rider from Appomattox Courthouse telling Grant, hey, they want to surrender. Well, boy, it sure would have been a lot faster if I'd gone that way. Now he has to go all the way across country again. It's a tough ride. That's why he was so mud splattered when he got to Appomattox. As you know, they're going to do it at the McLean house. Once again, the guy that was there at Bull Run Lee's going to get there before 1 o'clock. Grant arrives after 1.30 with his staff, including Robert Todd Lincoln. Robert, Captain Robert Todd Lincoln. The man died in, what, 1922? He was probably, the, he had to have been the last who remembered this occasion. Ord, Sheridan, and lesser generals uh, are also joining them. And you know, Grant apologizes for his appearance. Grant tells Lee he remembered meeting him in Mexico. And he tells him the occasion. And Lee says, I remember the occasion, but I probably saw a lot of people. I don't really remember you. Well, he's a lot younger. Uh, Grant was born in, what, 1822? Lee was born in 1807, so there's an age difference there. He, he didn't remember. Uh, he was a higher rank Grant uh, than Grant was. So uh, They have several minutes of small talk, and then uh, Lee asks that they get to the matter at hand, and Grant simply repeats uh, what he told him before. Uh, Grant and Lee says, well, let's put it in writing. So Grant writes it out, and uh, Lee sees a mistake. He's allowed to fix the mistake with his own hand. And uh, he, then he asks if his soldiers can take their horses and their mules for the spring plowing and uh, planting, and Grant says yes. And you know the rest there. They, talk, they sign the papers. The meeting's over by 4 p.m. They shake hands. Lee leaves the room first. Grant and his officers, they remove their hats as Lee gets on his horse to ride away and he tips his hat. 
and the Federals begin cheering and Grant says, stop it. Now, the Confederates are fellow citizens now, fellow countrymen now. And here's something you may not know, is the great furniture sale that took place in McLean's house. <laughs> Before anyone can go walking off with souvenirs, which is what they, you know, they did in that war. They took whatever they wanted. They didn't hear. Sheridan offered McLean $20 for Lee's table that he, that he uh, wrote on, and it was accepted. And Sheridan gave it to Custer as a gift for Mrs. Custer. Well, Ord gets into this. He buys Grant's table for $40 as a gift for Mrs. Grant. And soon everything in the room is sold. And then uh, in the other rooms, I mean, they're getting souvenirs. And it's believed that he must have made hundreds in federal currency. I, that's my line. I'm, I got to believe he made quite a bit of money. Federal currency, not Confederate. And meanwhile, okay, outside, Lee tells his men that it's over. The Federals distribute their food, which is the Confederate food that they got at Appomattox Station. Aren't they nice? They give it to the Confederates, so now they're eating. Some of them ate together, Confederates and Federals, but most of the Confederates were too overcome with grief, and they didn't join with any of the Federals. A lot of opposing officers who fought together in the Mexican War, like Grant and Longstreet, they got together and talked old times. And Lee, he had a line of people you know, out the door there who wanted to get a glimpse at the old, old guy and, and maybe have a word with him. He didn't want to have a word with anyone. And he just gave them a cold, hard stare. And isn't it wonderful that there's actually a picture out there with him looking like that? Because that's probably the way he looked on April 9th at his tent in his camp when people wanted to come talk to him. He, he wasn't in the mood. How did Lincoln and Davis find out about this? Well, Lincoln received word of Lee's surrender from Stanton. Remember, Lincoln was in City Point. Well, he had left a day or two before, and he steamed back to Washington. And according to one source, he was just getting off the, what was it called, the River, the River Queen, and comes walking down the plank, and there's Stanton smiling, and he tells him the news. Lincoln must have, you can just imagine Lincoln's reaction. Davis found out the following day. And what does he do? Well, he's got to leave Danville. He's got to get out of town again. He's going to move south to Greensboro, Oh, there it is. So it wasn't that far down there. And he wants to be closer to Johnson's army. Now, the day after the surrender, April 10th, Grant and Lee have their final meeting. And Grant tells Lee, we have to have a formal surrender. And Lee's thinking, we didn't talk about that yesterday. Formal? And Grant, yes, I want this formal. I want the men to line up. I want your men to go over and stack arms and then they'll be given their parole papers and we'll do this on Wednesday. They both agreed on Wednesday. And then Grant left uh, for Burksville, which was up the road. They had a train station there and he gets on the train and he goes back to City Point. That's where he had his headquarters. And then he takes a steamer to Washington. He's done with the war. And his staff had to work around the clock to print off 28,000 parole papers for Wednesday's formal ceremony. Now, I'm telling you all along this talk about all the men who were dropping out and all the losses Lee uh, took. And at the, I mean, three days earlier, there was only 10,000 men available for battle when Lee surrendered. So how did they come up to 28,000? They were all prisoners. Or maybe a great number of them came out of the woods when they caught the news and they wanted to get parole papers so they wouldn't be shot on sight. So here they came. All of a sudden, the number went from 10,000 up to 28,000. And John B. Gordon uh, surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia, and a lot of you guys know Joshua Chamberlain represented the North. Lee left Appomattox the next day. He thought it was important that his presence be there for his men. And everything broke up uh, on Thursday. So he, he left and returned to Richmond. He was escorted out of town, he and his party. Uh, a mile out of town and then they went to uh, Richmond and Easter Sunday was that Sunday April 16th Matthew Brady came and took his famous picture of Lee who was at home there he was yeah I don't know why he changed his mind or even agreed but he, I mean he was very reluctant but he accommodated I think his wife talked him into it Davis meets with Johnston and Beauregard 
These are the men he started with at Bull Run. These are the two that defeated McDowell at Bull Run. Now he, and they, they don't like each other. I'm sure McDowell and Johnston are okay, but Davis never got along with either two of those generals. Now here he is sitting with them, trying to talk about how we're gonna continue on. And Johnston and Beauregard are absolutely flabbergasted when Davis tells them he wants to continue the war by rounding up deserters. Well, I just showed you an example of 10,000 men being prepared for battle and 28,000 show up for parole papers. Oh, the men are out there. But, and he thinks there's as much as a half a million. We can continue this war if we round them up. Johnston speaks first, and he emphatically states that the war is over. We don't have the resources to continue, and these people have had enough. General Beauregard, what say you? And Beauregard simply says, I agree with General Johnston. And then Davis says, well, how can I surrender when Lee doesn't even recognize me as the true president of the Confederacy? And Johnston simply says, the military will do it. And I won't go into this because we all know about the assassination, but how did it affect the army? When it reached the Army of the Potomac on the evening of April 15th, a death-like stillness, this is somebody's letter, came over the army. That night, not a stir was made, not a sound was heard in all the camp. Sherman's officers were told to watch their soldiers carefully to prevent any retaliation against prisoners or locals. Union soldiers, as an example, lynched a prisoner in Virginia when he voiced his approval of the deed. And that happened uh, in other cases too, other areas. And so on April 17th, Joe Johnston hears of it from Sherman. And he's shocked, he had no idea. And he immediately denounces the act as a disgrace. And he hopes Sherman isn't gonna charge it to the Confederacy. Sherman responded that he did not believe the army could be involved, but would not say so as much for Davis. <laughs> So maybe Davis had something to do with it. Some people believe that. There's been books written about that. They meet up at the Bennett Farm, and um, Johnston's first surrender on April 17th is rejected by Edwin Stanton, Secretary of the War, due to Sherman's unauthorized terms. Maybe you don't know what those terms are. I'm going to put them here. Sherman uh, accepted the surrender of all remaining armies. Johnston didn't have the authority to surrender all remaining armies. That's worthless. And Sherman was going to allow all Southern governments to continue. He doesn't have the authority to do that. That comes from Washington. Stanton was livid. He wanted to drum him out of the army right away. Grant calmed him down, says, I'll go down there. I'll talk to him. We'll do it again. So they do on April 26th, using the same terms as Lee. Uh, Johnston's forces included all the departments in Georgia, the Carolinas, and Florida. 89,000 in all. He had 89,000. Lee had 10,000 at the end. Two down, two to go, real quick. Zachary Taylor's son, Richard Taylor, commands the last of the forces east of the Mississippi. Here he is. And he surrenders to General Edward Canby on May 4th. And when John, uh, Jeff Davis is captured on May 10th in Georgia, this general, the last, with a failed army, he grudgingly surrenders his Department of Trans Mississippi, that means to the west side of the Mississippi, to Canby on May 26th, so it's over. Two cabinet members, you know, Davis was trying to escape, so were some of the cabinet members. John C. Breckinridge, Secretary of War, former, former uh, general. Um, he deposited $150,000, I read, in treasury gold coins into a Georgia bank. It, there wasn't anything that really added more to that that I read because that seems to be a big uh, mystery about what happened to all the gold. Uh, well, it supposedly went into a Georgia bank. Anyway, he reached England in late July and he will not return to the U.S. until 1869. Judah P. Benjamin, Secretary of State, he was Jefferson Davis's very last supporter during the final days. And he reached England on August 30th and he never returned to the United States. He became an advisor to Queen Victoria, died in 1884. Here's, I only have two more slides. Here's a loose end, the CSS Shenandoah. Now, uh, the smaller bands, they discontinued and they uh, just went home, forced, uh, forced, uh, help me out, forced, 
well, that's his last name, Forrest, uh, the Quebec Cavalry uh, General. Men like him, Mosby, uh, they all just went home. It was over, all right? Uh, but the CSS Shenandoah continued taking uh, prizes in the Pacific. They didn't know the war was over. They're still killing and pillaging in the name of the uh, uh, Confederacy. And when Captain James Waddle, there he is, is told, learns in August that the war is over, well, he could have gone into San Francisco or somewhere close by. Uh, no, he, wouldn't, he didn't want to do that. His ship was built in Liverpool. That was its home port. That's where he sailed it out of. He wanted to take it back to Liverpool, England. So he finds out in August and he gets to Liverpool in November. And, oh, they were out looking for him. He was lucky. He got back to Liverpool and he surrendered his vessel on November 6th. And the Confederacy's last remaining active flag is lowered, November 1865. So that's a loose end. Here's the very last, very loose end. I like this. It's kind of like those Japanese soldiers that were still on the islands. In 1866, in June, a detachment of three Confederates leave their bogey, boggy outpost in Virginia's Great Dismal Swamp. And they turn themselves in. They take the oath of allegiance and they return to their homes. So now the war is really over. The last soldiers <laughs> have turned themselves in. And these soldiers, they, now they're veterans. And we know stories, a lot of the veterans and all the different uh, <clears throat> events that took place over the years and they'll go on into the 20th century and they'll go on into the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. They're still veterans alive during World War II. And then you have a few left, one left, in the 1950s, 1956. This is the last veteran, dies at age 109. Albert, Albert Wilson, a drummer boy. He's in the 1st Minnesota Heavy Artillery. He enlisted in October of 1864. He never saw action, but he's a legitimate veteran. His birth year is disputed, though. He said it was in 1847. The Census Bureau said it was 1850. They looked at him and they said, there's no way you're 109. You don't look a day over 106. <laughs> and they, they found out he was born in 1847. So anyway, regardless, he was the last authenticated veteran of the Grand Army of the Republic. And I want to thank you for coming. You've been a great audience. Thank you.